Join me, if you will, in this prayer. May the blessings of God, the Spirit, be upon the reading, preaching, hearing, and doing of the Word. Amen. Amen. I want to point out quickly that our bulletin today, uh, the front of it, is from an organization called Reconciling Ministries Network. Reconciling Ministries Network has been, uh, uh, has been in existence since 1984, working to get that horrible language and those terrible restrictions out of the Book of Discipline. And so without that organization, I wouldn't be standing here today. Uh, and so I wanted us to know who they are. I also want us to have a discussion very quickly, as soon as we can, about becoming a Reconciling Ministries congregation so that the world around us knows that all means all and that everyone is welcome here. Also in the bulletin, the uh, call to worship is from the Reconciling Ministries Liturgy today. I want to make sure they get, they get credit for that. All right, our sacred text today comes from the J.B. Phillips interpretation of the Bible. Um, 1 John 3, 16 through 19. We know and to some extent realize the love of God for us because Christ expressed it in laying down His life for us. We must in turn express our love by laying down our lives for those who are our siblings. But as for the well-to-do man who sees his sibling in want but shuts his eyes and his heart, How could anyone believe that was the love of God? My children, let us not love merely in theory or in words. Let us love in sincerity and in practice. And these, my children, are the words attributed to our Lord for the people of God. Amen. So I want to read to you the statement from Reconciling Ministries issued Friday afternoon. Over the last two weeks, members of the United Methodist Church gathered in Charlotte, North Carolina for the postponed 2020 General Conference. While the General Conference made many important decisions, we want to lift up some specific changes that relate to the full inclusion of LGBTQ plus people into the life of this church. This general conference voted to lift an existing denominational funding ban on supporting LGBTQ plus ministries and affirming LGBTQ plus education. The conference voted to strike down a 40 year ban on self-avowed practicing homosexual pastors. The conference voted to remove penalties for clergy or congregations holding same-sex weddings. The conference voted to initiate a moratorium on all judicial proceedings concerning human sexuality. We give thanks for progress in the pursuit of justice and inclusion. May our connection grow in love and may we seek new ways to be the body of Christ in a divided world. May this be a new day for those who've been harmed by our church and a new day for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. One of the other great things uh, that happened is deacons were given full rights and authority to to consecrate the elements uh, for communion. And so this morning I'm going to give a shout out to my sweet and friend and mentor to Aaron Jackson, who is a deacon at New World United Methodist in Arlington. For the first time in her career today, she is consecrating the elements for communion. So uh, it, we're going to have some fun, folks. All right? Uh, freedom feels good. So now we can get back to the business of what it is we're supposed to be doing as the body of Christ in this world. So a few weeks ago on a trip, um, I watched a movie called Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. Uh, It won Best Picture for 2023. I don't ever watch, I don't go to the movies when these things first come come out because, well, you know, who can afford to go to the movies anymore? Plus, I make much better popcorn. 
And so, uh, so, but I watched this uh, on the plane on the way to Savannah. And so there were some things that um, I had to stop the movie every now and then because it overwhelmed me. Because I know where we've gone as humanity since then. But uh, just some things that I, I wanted to share with you this morning. So that bomb was tested on the morning of July 16th, 1945. 21 days later, barely three weeks of discussion, the first nuclear weapon was dropped over the city of Hiroshima on August 6th. They chose Hiroshima because it was an important economic and military hub. The Japanese did not surrender that day. So on August 9th, the second nuclear weapon dropped over the city of Nagasaki. The results were catastrophic for the Japanese people and the repercussions of that catastrophic for our world. Now, I'm not here to argue whether or not we should have dropped that bomb or not. I wasn't alive in 1945. Uh, my great uncle was in a prisoner of war camp in the Philippines when that bomb was dropped. He died before they could liberate his camp. But I do want to discuss today, I, I want to talk about this single-minded, relentless pursuit for the creation of a nuclear weapon. The U.S. spared no expense to obtain this weapon. They brought the greatest scientists of that era. They assembled them together. They built a city for them to inhabit. They added laboratories and testing facilities and assembly lines. They spent, between 1941 and 1945, $2.2 billion creating that weapon of mass destruction. Today, that's the equivalent of $37 billion. And it wasn't just money they talked about. It was also the loss of human life. They set acceptable casualty limits. They decided in a meeting, where were they going to get the biggest bang for their buck, so to speak? No expense was spared in the creation of that weapon. Now, we gather here today as Easter people. Today is the sixth Sunday after Easter. And we know of another time in history when no expense was spared. We know that God in the human body of Jesus of Nazareth entered this world at a specific time in history. We know that God left the glories of heaven to be born humbly in a manger. In a manger. God made flesh dwelled among creation until in a fit of anger and fear God was crucified. But we are Easter people and praise God, the story didn't end with the cross. After the death of that body, God spared no expense in fighting death to bring our eternal souls back into relationship with our Creator. God gave us not a weapon of mass destruction, but a method for mass restoration. And we sit here today, the recipients of that unconditional an unimaginable grace of God. We are the products of God sparing no expense. And in today's sacred text, we're instructed to live as the children of God. Now, it's funny to me, God has to continuously remind us that we're God's children. Over and over, we read that in the New Testament. And then I realize, well, you don't have to say to my son all the time, I'm still your mother. And so I understand a little bit God's frustration with us. But God continuously reminds us to embrace that love that covers us and then to share it with each other. It says in verse 18, we know and to some extent realize the love of God for us because Christ expressed it 
in laying down his life for us. And it ends with this instruction. My children, let us not love just in theory or in words, but let us love in sincerity and in practice. Folks, what if with that same single-minded determination that was used to create that mass, that weapon of mass destruction, what if the church used that same single-minded determination to create a space for all the world to be restored to God? What if in 2024, the church was given $37 billion? We, we could probably, we could use a little of that today, right? We don't need the whole $37 billion. But we'd take $3.7 million of it, right? Just give us just 10% of it, all right? $37 billion. What if somebody handed that to the church, the big C church, and said, save this world. If we had $37 billion and we were instructed to save the world, could we get past our humanness and reconnect to our godliness? Could we get past our childish, childish fixations with controlling each other and being in each other's business? And could we just love each other instead? Could we stop meddling in things that are none of our business in the first place? And instead guarantee that every single human on this planet had access to food and shelter and water and med medical care. And what about education for everyone? And what about just a guarantee that everyone would have a dignified and peaceful existence? Could we stop destroying this planet that God has given us to inhabit and preserve it instead? Could we do what we're told in verse 19? Could we love in sincerity and in practice? Or in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, could we do what God said when God told us to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our minds and our neighbors as, us, as ourselves? Now, I stand here today differently than I've stood before you ever. I said to you a minute ago, freedom feels good. I am free to be myself, to live my authentic self. But I know this freedom I have today wasn't free. No expense was spared to guarantee full affirmation and acceptance for the LGBTQ community in Christian churches. And the United Methodist Church is not the first church to have this conflict or to resolve this conflict. Many other denominations have gone through this same thing. I know that the Reconciling Ministries Network has spared no expense since 1984 to garner our freedom. The UMC spared no expense in the last two weeks to change itself from an instrument of exclusion and hate into an instrument of God's love and inclusion. And it isn't just me. Those of you sitting in this room and hearing my voice online, you're also free today. Those of you who are also LGBTQ+, and those who have loved someone who is queer, you are free today. Your children, your siblings, your parents who have lived their lives in the shadows because of their sexual orientation, they're free today. And you are free to love them out in the open. And we celebrate with you today. The other truth about all of this is that with great blessing comes great responsibility. And today I stand here freed from the hate and bigotry of the old UMC. But there's still work to do, folks. You know, I don't preach a sermon without some kind of assignment when it's over, right? So this battle that we just won, this is only one battle. And there are others that we must fight. And we must now press on towards the prize that is set before us, as Paul says. We must stand as a powerful advocate for anyone who has been the subject or the object of bigotry and hate. Our church is free. St. Matthew is free. Our church is now free to shine a light in this community as a truly welcoming congregation. 
And I want to take a moment, Max Brennan, to say thank you. Because for as long as you have had breath and been a preacher of the gospel, you have stood as an ally for the LGBTQ plus population. And I want to say thank you for that. His article in the Meadowbrook News talking about being gay was nobody's business and God didn't care about all of that. That's what brought me here. Now, I stay here because of the great preaching. <laughs> His great preaching. And the great music. And the loving people here. But this church is now free to be that beacon and not worry about repercussions from the, from the leadership of the United Methodist Church. And so I thought of some things that we can do to identify ourselves as a truly welcoming congregation. The first thing we can do is we can start to market this sanctuary in this building as a place where weddings can be held. As it says now in the documents from uh, General Conference, Weddings between two persons of consenting age. And you know what, Max? You and I can now officiate those weddings and not be worried about being defrocked or facing legal consequences. And we can begin to market our congregation as a space where any human being called in to ministry has a place where they can openly and freely receive the love and mentorship that I have received from this congregation. We can welcome those folks called into ministry. We can begin to add our voices. I don't know what all this is up here. We can begin to add all our voices to the Voice of Reconciling Ministries Network, identifying ourselves as champions of freedom and fighters against injustice. We can look around our neighborhood and our and our our counties and our districts, and we can look around and see these areas of bigotry and injustice and ex exclus exclusivity. And we can fight those battles right here in our neighborhood. Folks, we want to share the gospel in the newspaper. Let's do something that lands us on the front page. Somebody said amen? amen. All right. Now, I want you to know, this week I have received so many beautiful, sweet, wonderful messages from people congratulating me about the decisions of the UMC. I've also received several wonderful, kind messages apologizing to me for the trauma that this has caused. Beverly acknowledged, and I'm grateful to you, because one of the things this church can also do just take responsibility for its part in the trauma that we've inflicted on those people in the LGBTQ plus community. We can take responsibility for the history the United Methodist Church has as far as slavery and racism and sexism goes. And we can begin to help people heal from their trauma because I'm not the only traumatized one. And the UMC, well, that's not the only perpetrator. And so we have the opportunity now, St. Matthew, to tell the world that this place at 2414 Hitson Lane, this place, this congregation is a place for healing and for restoration. A place where trauma is openly addressed and where healing from that trauma is our priority. And really, the most important thing I want you to hear from me today is that while the United Methodist Church has affirmed the sacred worth of all persons, affirmation was not their gift to give. My affirmation and the worth of all creation was secured on the cross. Jesus Christ gives us the freedom to be our authentic selves. The shed blood and the resurrection of Christ paid for my freedom and guarantees the same freedoms for everyone else. One of the concerns that was voiced to me this week is that because of the results of General Conference, some folks who are not LGBTQ will feel excluded. 
Please don't feel excluded. <laughs> I told them, they're, you're not talking about my church. But Christ paid your freedom as well. Christ paid for the freedom of all of us. We're all beings of sacred worth. And there is room at this table for every single one of us. Now, what we learned from Oppenheimer and what we've seen in our world this week is that human beings will do whatever it takes to destroy each other. And I'm asking you is could we, with or without the same resources, do whatever it takes to love each other and care for each other? Can we spare no expense to love the way that we're loved? Time will tell our story. This is a historic day for some of us. It's a historic day for this church. It's a historic day for the United Methodist Church. And history is keeping the score right now. And we're winning this battle in small pockets of the world. We won a big battle this week. And I am thrilled. But if we spared no expense, if we grabbed hold of our single-minded determination and we made a commitment to love this world the way God loved us, I really believe that we could win back this world to God. Because God so loved this world, God gave God's very best. God spared no expense to be in relationship with us. Pray with me, please. Eternal God, from whose gentle hands none can snatch us away, give us faith to believe that we are known and loved with a passion strong enough to bring the whole world back to you. Through Jesus Christ, the source of all life, and all the people said, Amen.